And Donna will tell us uh, all the good work that they've been doing. So let's welcome Donna Baranski Walker. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'll pass around a, a sign up sheet if anyone that would like to be on our mailing list, and also some brochures. Um, I'm honored to come back to the Cousins Club because it was maybe three years ago or so that I spoke here with Mary Edith Abusaba. And, um, and, and many of you have attended some of our events in the Bay Area as well. Um, so very exciting to have this opportunity to come back. Um, and it's what you do, your coming together, is, is, is an important thing. It's worthy of recognition it beyond beyond you. Um, I'm wearing a bracelet from last week I was in Washington DC and I happened to be in a celebration, a 40 year celebration for N Street Village, something that Lutherans, the Jewish community, the Catholics had all put together. And 40 years ago in Washington DC, it must have looked as bleak as it does for us with regard to the Middle East now. Um, this was a burned out neighborhood. It was just after Martin Luther King had been killed. And that community came together to create um, a place for homeless women, the, the, the most vulnerable in society. And 40 years later, they were celebrating their accomplishment in a remarkable city of, of um, permanent housing for displaced women, for um, a, just a very restorative place. And it was the the women's art cooperative that was giving the bracelets out. Um, it felt to me like a moment of hope. And, um, and I think that the key was about people of many faiths taking action and doing something together and making a difference together. So I, I really celebrate what, you're, what you've been about for so many years and, and hope that you continue and, and, are, are, and take heart from the, the work that you've accomplished. Um, so let me tell you about the work that we've been working on, that we've been developing and, and our efforts, um, often with, with your help. Um, it's been, these past two years have been a time of realizing milestones for Rebuilding Alliance. Um, and I'd like to tell you about our Rebuilding to Remain program, but I'd also like to tell you about our efforts to really impact Area C and keep it standing, keep this village standing. but really change U.S. policy um, and how that, and I'd like your feedback as to whether you think this is something that you would like to engage in further. Um, you might remember, so Rebuilding Alliance, we're a, an American group based in the San Francisco area in San Mateo. We've been around 10 years now um, and we're formed to rebuild war-torn communities and make them safe. We, we want to also be able to um, hold on to a vision of, of equal um, opportunity, equal safety, equal security for all peoples in Israel and Palestine. Um, and what we, we're the group that helped rebuild a home for the family Rachel Corey stood to protect in Gaza. Um, Rachel Corey's parents were our founding board members. Um, we also started in East Jerusalem, so we were very much involved with the um, Bet Arabia with ICANN in our early days. And then we received a small grant to build a school that wouldn't be demolished again. And we chose this village, Al Aqaba Village, um, because it looked like a really good place to start. Not near any borders, at that time no settlements nearby. They had just won their case before the Israeli High Court. Um, so. I think what I'm going to present to you, it's about this philosophy to do something big, to think globally and act globally, start with something small and start where it counts. And I'd like to pr put forward that this is of such a place. Um, this is a Muslim village that built its mosque in the shape of a peace sign. So double minaret, very unusual to see in the Middle East. We came there because they won their court agreement, like I mentioned. And we started by building a kindergarten. Um, it was something the villagers who were finally able to return home to their village, they thought, start with this kindergarten. They really wanted to come home. Go ahead. Can you talk about the court case? I, I don't know anything about it. Yes. 
And very interesting, this place, the village of El Aqaba, had been used by the Israeli army for 30 years for live fire training exercises. There were three um, training camps, one inside the village itself. And the villagers never did anything. Um, they were just living their lives. The army would burst into their homes in the middle of the night, guns drawn, and 12 villagers were killed, 36 wounded. The mayor, who you'll see, um, has been in a wheelchair um, since the age of 16. He was the first casualty. And when I brought him, by the way, to speak here in Orange County, but also to speak to Congress, he spoke in Hebrew, not because he'd been in prison, but because he'd learned um, Hebrew through many years in the hospital, um, because his recovery path would be aided by um, doctors in Israel. Um, and he'd continue on for college in, in Israel as well. So his view of the world is, is a very inviting view. It's not about retaliation, it's about help, having people come as neighbors um, together. And it's an interesting message to bring forward in a world that sees boundaries in other ways. This is my kindergarten. So what was the court case? The court case in 2002, um, the court, I would say they won the case, but interestingly when I read the documents recently, they actually lost the case. What happened was that the court ruled though on an agreement that the army would no longer use the village for live fire training. And that agreement has held, with one exception for about 24 hours this past year, it's held elegantly. Um, and that was enough. The army, when I went to visit in 2003, the army had just removed the one training camp from inside the village. They, they'd actually blown up their own camp and moved it outside. So they, they really honored the agreement of staying out of the village boundaries for training. There is training, live fire, all around the village. Um, this is Jordan Valley, Area C. Um, but, but in the village, it's, it's, it's held. The agreement is held. Um, and it was really exciting because it meant the villagers saw that as a reason to be able to come home. Those, those 700 people who evacuated when the army was using it for training, and they were all living around the boundaries, they would, they would like to come back to the land that they own. Um, interestingly, the, the land is not in dispute, but, but this question of army was the case at, at that time. And it was, they won it with the help of many Israeli NGOs, um, non-governmental organizations. Um, so very exciting. The, the lawyers were um, Israeli Jewish lawyers, and it was a, it was really a team effort that got them their safety. I'm very proud of this kindergarten. When I built it, we thought we were building the, only a first floor, so that the Japanese, the Norwegians, and the Belgians built the second floor, and Rebuilding Alliance through that speaking tour in 2008 built the third floor. The women's sewing circle is on the third floor. The second floor has the Ibn Rushd Library, and the Japanese have just installed a herbal infusion factory, tea bags, um, and the kindergarten on the ground floor now serves 160 children. Um, one more comment, um, 160 children. Well, the village itself only has 300 people, and it's not that they had a prolific year. It's that um, the little school bus is picking up children from the entire neighboring area, so displaced villagers, people in other towns, everyone's sending their children to this kindergarten because it's it's really been very well designed and very well regarded. And, and what is this village in the background there? Tayasir. So we're talking about the northern area. Tubas is the major town. This is south of Janine, north of Nablus. Tubas is a large town and Tayasir is nearby. And that's a Palestinian? Yes. And you're taking this picture from inside the Al Aqaba village. Village, right? Also a Palestinian village. Um, oops, sorry. Going in the right direction here. So rebuilding to remain. This program that we designed with the villagers is first and foremost about village-centered design. You know, how would they accommodate those returning villagers? What would the houses look like? How could you afford them? What we did was we brought architects and engineers to work with the village. And we, we did that because we came out second in the Global Giving Matching Grant competition. Um, so very exciting on all of that. Um, second, precedent-setting legal work. This is the first Palestinian village in Area C to issue its own building permits. And we are the first to issue a mortgage loan. Um, so it's also important. Well, why don't you explain what Area C is? Sure. Um, Area C 
back to that weird map that I showed you. So you, you might notice that you, you see dark and light areas. So area C is what effectively the interstitial tissue. Um, it's the 63% of the West Bank that's controlled exclusively by the Israeli army. Um, the rest, areas A, controlled by the Palestinian Authority, or now they're calling it the Palestinian National Authority. Um, that means that security and building permits are issued by the Palestinian government. Area B, um, building permits are issued by the Palestinian government, but security is joint between the arm, Israeli army and Palestinian police. But in area C, that, that one contiguous part of the Swiss cheese, it's all Israeli army controlled. And this comes from the Oslo Accords. It was supposed to transfer back to Palestinian control within 18 months. That didn't happen. Um, and a lot of questions. When you hear about settlement expansion, settlements occur in area C. That, that, that there's a, a trend of, of demolition orders being issued to um, Palestinian villages. There are 149 of them. And there's the other part of that trend is um, settlements are getting building permits and expanding. Question, if you don't mind, can sure. you keep on that map for just a second? Sure. Light blue is what part of city? Light blue is, it's um, actually military, but it's the, effectively the Jordan Valley. That's part C. It's part of C, And right. part B, I just, I assume it's next to that. B is the beige and A is the dark brown. A, what is, what do you mean by A? It's the Palestinian Authority no, Control and Security. Okay. 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 So A, effectively, are large towns. Um, okay. Jericho and Ramallah and okay. Bethlehem, Hebron. Thank you, I'm sorry to distract Oh, no problem. It's a tough, it's a tough thing to explain, frankly. <laughs> you know, the logic of it is <laughs> really rough. Um, okay, fourth part. Crowdsource mortgage financing, how do you get people to help with building? Well, maybe we all share the risk, because these are, after all, at risk of demolition and even further. And the last part of making this work has to do with worldwide advocacy. You can't help people build and then lose it to demolitions. You've got to find a way to change the, the laws. It's not a hurricane. We're, we're not, it's not as hard as, a, as trying to reroute a hurricane. It's just about changing really bad policy and making it fair, realistic, um, de democratic, all of those things. Um, so that's my, my take on what we've been doing. Um, the charrette. We brought the architects and engineers to al village to work with the villagers um, directly. In a, a charrette is a word that means you bring together all of the resources needed for this art, and you do it with the community to create a plan that overcomes significant constraints. And I must say, these have some significant constraints. So it was a good challenge. But here, I took the picture with the architects and engineers. They're all looking pretty miserable. One of our significant constraints is that these are poor villagers. The best they could afford was about $20,000. And here we're talking about building a home for maybe a family of seven or nine for $20,000. That's a constraint. And that's why they looked challenged. It was a, a remarkable challenge. It shows as the lead architect for this, Hani Hassan. Um, he is a Palestinian Colombian architect, especially interested in recycled quarry stone. So it's a, it is a quarry area, and there is a major environmental issue with stone that isn't used for building, the stuff that's left over. Um, now, he didn't have experience in low-income housing design, as you can see. However, he did have this, which was, um, he had won the International Architecture Award for a desert house project in Jericho, an energy generating villa, if you will, but energy generating. So somebody who could clearly speak to the eco um, design values that would be really important for the village, in addition to the low income housing. Um, this is the mayor, Haj Sami Sadek, um, certainly a visionary who has just brought this spirit of reconciliation, of good neighborliness, of willingness to work with everyone to keep his village standing. And it, it's important because it's, it's a village that's never had um, any history of violence from themselves. You know, they, they have been victimized, but they have never retaliated in any way. They really seek to be good neighbors 
And that, in a way, is the challenge of the story. How do you bring forward, like, who better would you want to have as neighbors than, than this village? You know, so how would you bring that story so that people can begin to understand that and trust that? Um, the villagers, here we have the three families that would be moving into the first three homes and the process where we began to work with them, the architect designing possibilities. Um, Steve Coyle, we brought the founder of the National Charette Institute to Alakaba to, to, to coordinate this design um, week. And here he's designing with the mayor in a master plan in layers, like kind of depending on the wind of occupation or diplomacy. I'm presenting here at BIMCOM, an Israeli group planners for planning rights that's been very helpful in supporting the village and in bringing forward Area C issues to Congress. We brought BIMCOM representatives to Congress along with the mayor um, in 2008. Um, so they presented, the architect did what architects do. He presented the best, biggest houses he could think of. The families did what families do. We love those houses. That was a big problem <laughs> because um, far too expensive. So we had to really put our heads together. How are we going to solve this? People turn to rebuilding lines. Surely you can give more. I'm like, you don't understand. We're a small nonprofit. You know? like, we can only do what, what makes sense. And our cap is $20,000. So they had to figure out ways to solve the problem. And they did. They came up with a solution that really met all the family's needs. And here they're all signing um, uh, um, uh, for the, the home that they would accept. Um, three bedrooms, very good breakthrough. A, a home that will be um, buildable to a second floor, also very exciting. So here's the designs for the homes. We're very excited about this. They are Colombian, so he really wants them to be colorful design statements. They're, they're eco-friendly in the way that they handle airflow, and they build to a second level. So over time, the families, this is really important, though. It's like social security, you, the son and the family will live upstairs and they can add that second floor. So all of those features are designed in. Um, as I mentioned, the town became the first to issue building permits, and that happened in March of this year. We became the first to issue um, a mortgage loan, different from any other mortgage loan, because in ours, we write in that if the home is demolished, well, then the family stops payment until occupancy is restored. So Donna, why would the home be demolished? Can you explain that? The whole village, when we started building that kindergarten, the whole village came under demolition orders. The mosque, the medical clinic, the kindergarten, all the homes except for two. And um, we were able to stop the bulldozers with the help of the American consulate. And actually it's a guy who now is at the National Security Agency in the White House, Prem Kumar. He stopped the bulldozers. And Rebuilding Alliance helped the village hire its lawyer to go back to the high court, um, which we did in 2008 in the spring before I brought the mayor to speak into Congress. Um, so it's still pending. The, um, the court gave us some wiggle room. The court ruled in the 2008 case that for the time being, the center of the village can remain standing. So we're building these homes in the center it's, a, it's, a, it's an arbitrarily drawn line, though, and our responsibility is to keep the whole thing standing. Um, crowdsource mortgage finding, financing, I mentioned about global giving. Three times a year they do a matching grant competition for 24 hours. You probably get far too many emails from me on that day, but it works. <laughs> so we're able to raise like sometimes $26,000 on that whole network of matching grant day. So it, it matters a lot. Um, if you can pay attention when they happen, thank you. That would be great. We have three in construction now. We're really close to finishing them. I was hoping that I was going to give you some really great news today. It's not going to happen today, but it'll be close. Um, so from a slab to construction, that's my kindergarten in the background and the mosque, of course, um, to now the roof support. So very exciting to have them in place. Um, Shahad is one of, part of one of the families. She goes to play at the home site every day. Everybody's asking when will they finish. Um, we just transferred our latest global giving match over and we will finish our part by the end of this year. And the, the news that I, uh, I mean, there's a, a matching grant coming from the Palestinian government 
And that's what I'm hoping to be able to announce shortly. When we were there in June, my board chair, who was there for the first time, she was really impressed because six other families are also building. The Rural Women's Association building has been completed, and I'll show you some remarkable designs from that. The brick factory is in place. Um, she was amazed about how tidy it is. The, the, the mayor is very proud of his dumpsters and regular garbage pickup. Also, cisterns in place for all the future homes, and the Japanese government delivers water because the village currently is prohibited from drilling wells, even though there's water in this whole area. So this is the first bricks from the brick factory. Um, also has demolition orders, but everyone's doing fine so far, and our efforts with Congress is keeping this standing. Um, here's the mayor with the new teabag factory. Um, we just got a rotary grant for a birthing center at the Al Amal Health Clinic. The clinic was built by the British, our Rotary Grant is coming from mm, seven Rotary Clubs in the north near San Francisco, including the Chinatown Rotary, um, and the Rotary Club of Ramallah, and the Rotary Club of Nazareth in Israel. So very exciting to have pulled that together and um, working on getting the ultrasound equipment shipped in next. Now, one of the surprises in working with this village, for me, was um, here is my kindergarten, right there. And this huge tract of land turns out to be owned by the Catholic Church, by the Vatican, by the Latin Patriarch. And um, it's 22,000 dunam of land. It's a huge tract of land that extends far beyond the village boundaries. Um, but it presents a tremendous opportunity. Um, and we were able to go in June. We invited, but that, there's a Palestinian American architect in Palo Alto. He said, they're never going to talk to you until you go with plans in your hand. So we went with plans. He, he drew up the plans. His name is Fred Bisharat. From the Bisharat family, it became where uh, the Bisharat home in Jerusalem became Golda Meir's house eventually. Um, it, he, as an architect, uh, he was right about this. He, he said, I'm drawing you the plans. It, it's plans for a rehabilitation hospital. Can you imagine? Um, a rehabilitation hospital on Christian land next to a Muslim village with Jewish doctors? <laughs> Let's call it the Good Samaritan Hospital and put it there in the Jordan Valley. <laughs> so we, we've begun negotiation with the Catholic Church, with the Latin Patriarch's office, and got them to visit with us about this. So we're ramping up to the next level. The Quakers who I met with, they said, all right, it's time. Put up a big billboard. Put up a picture of that hospital. Good Samaritan Rehabilitation Center, the home of the future Good Samaritan Rehabilitation Center. Put it up now. <laughs> let, let the world begin to think about this design. And the architects all say this. I'm an engineer by training um, from MIT. And, but the architects are even more determined or open-minded or visionary, perhaps, than I ever am. They said, draw it. Just keep drawing it. Draw, get all the details drawn. Nobody will know what you're talking about until you show them and they hold it in their hands. And so I invite you to think about this with us and give us encouragement and we can keep going on it. Um, here's Fred Bisharat, um, who drew some plans and just a sense of what the rehabilitation hospital could begin to look like there. Um, so what are we really providing? What is Rebuilding Alliance doing? We're providing a form of demolition prevention in, in a counterintuitive way that building and helping people move home will keep their village standing. And it'll keep it standing because all of us join in sharing that risk with us. All of us contribute, and hopefully all of us call con Congress. Um, we want to begin to actually form Palestinian town planning task forces here in the United States to really bring forward their right to issue building permits, just like any other town. Um, we have a, a vision with al Aqaba for 30 homes and three are the starter. We hope to get to 10 as a proof of concept further. We, we'd like this to be a model for other, the other 149 villages in Area C. Um, a finance model right now, that piece, the, the part in red, I was hoping that that was what I was announcing tonight. If you're watching the budgeting process and this question of punishment for the UN vote, our Congress people are withholding funds from Palestinian development promised funds, guess what? It trickles down all the way to the Lalakaba because that amount of money per home, it, it actually isn't all that much in multi-million dollar budgets. Um, it's been promised, it's not been forthcoming, 
This week we heard it was going to come through and I asked them to get it done by today so I could give you good news. It's not there yet, but it, hopefully, inshallah, we'll get there soon. Um, so we ask you to dream big with al Akaba. I've been looking at how to raise funds for 10 homes. Um, I'm not... We're, we're not naive. Um, here is a picture of what it looks like, the demolition orders. BIMCOM, I mentioned the Israeli group, um, Planners for Planning Rights, they were able to get the Army's maps of all the demolition orders. There's over 12,500 demolition orders against Palestinian homes and barns and schools, mosques in Area C. That, that settlement expansion is coming at the price of people being dislocated, being removed from their land. And it, it's a very high price. Um, it's, it's really serious. For us, it comes down to something as simple as how will the children get to kindergarten. There's the kindergarten. This is the road, one of the roads to the kindergarten, and it keeps getting demolished. So I go to Congress, and the mayor repaves it as best he can, or regrades it. It's been pretty effective. The thing that surprised me, though, and might surprise you as well, is that even the most conservative Congress people will make calls on your behalf as a constituent if you ask them to help keep a village standing or a kindergarten standing. So when I was in al Aqaba for the charrette, I spent a little time going to talk to the army. Why are you demolishing these homes? Why are you demolishing this village? And um, interestingly enough, the, the man who issues the demolition orders probably doesn't write them, but he is, he's the one who delivers them. He, when I went to his office, he said, are you Jackie Spear, uh, my congresswoman? Um, and I said, no, I'm not Congresswoman Spear, but I know exactly how that letter got to your desk. So I found it really heartening that a letter, you know, by talking to the staffer, asking them to enter, engage for their constituent, for me, that, that they actually did get the letter to the right guy. You know, and I, I really do believe that matters a lot. Maybe the only thing that matters. Here's my board chair walking that same road. On the outskirts of the village, um, especially those families are most at risk, and those are the ones who've been you know, recently demolished, those homes. You're seeing a level of demolitions happening in East Jerusalem, in the south of the West Bank, near, the, near Hebron. Um, you're seeing it happen in the north as well. We're part of a network of UN groups that UN OCHA has formed, the Displacement Working Group. So we're, we're trying to you know, pull, pull resources um, so that we can keep this from happening, not just to bring tents when it does, but to keep it from happening at all. Rebuilding to Remain is also about advocacy. Because you can't have this man stand alone or even have me stand alone. When the kindergarten was heading toward the court, I didn't want to lose it. It was my first major project in the West Bank. So I asked the Palo Alto um, City Council if I could move my office to a tent in front of the city hall on the Martin Luther King Plaza. And I put up a big sign, it takes the village to save the village. And now I actually would say a different sign, it takes the whole world to save the village. Um, it, it was effective in that it's fully networked, so it's Silicon Valley, so it, you know, even, and then within days people were teaching me how to walk the halls of Congress. Um, so it's that advocacy that I build on in the tools that I'm going to show you next. Um, we've, when, when Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke before Congress last year, I listened to that and said, my God, he's talking about Jordan Valley. He's, that's where our village is. And so we become a barometer for whatever policy is going to impact that area. Isn't I, my message to my local peace group was, isn't there anyone who knows the Shahidi mapping? Leah Park came forward and she began to do something called the Palestine crisis map, where she's simply mapping news, English language news, every day, and putting it into a map that, that's interactive. And if you want, you can register for this. They'll send you a, um, an automatic e email if you want to follow any particular village or area or particular issue. Um, it's, it's really nicely designed. Ushahidi is from Kenya, means witness in Swahili. And it was designed during the Kenyan elections and used very effectively in Haiti and in Japan, many places. 
I've taken a step further though. We, we added a button here and beyond so that we could turn the world from the West Bank, so this is that kidney bean shape there, um, we could turn the world all the way to our side of the world and begin to look at congressional districts. And as you might know, <laughs> congressional districts are funny shaped. They change every 10 years with the census. They're, they, they're, they, they have odd shapes because of gerrymandering, you know, changing and balancing and, and whatnot. Um, they're proportional to population. So Montana it, here is its own congressional district. It's because it's sparsely populated. And, and here, by you, we're seeing lots of congressional districts because you're very densely populated. We've created a system, and um, even now gone beyond contact Congress, but the idea is that what if we can begin to show how many people in the district care about this issue? Then we become stronger. We can show our Congress people that we are people of multi-faiths, that we care about this and we want their intervention. We can ask groups to join as a group and show allegiances. You know, all the things that make Congress people certain or, or more secure in taking on a very challenging um, uh, issue like this. Um, so what I learned in the last few weeks is to actually invite people not just to come into a map, because maybe that doesn't have as much relevance for us, but to join us in what I'm calling Stay Human conference calls. Putting a speaker from Israel, a peacemaker there, peacemaker from Gaza or from the West Bank or from East Jerusalem on the line with congressional staffers from your district and asking you as constituents to join that call. Um, and that and it actually is a, a, a really strong strategy in every dimension. Getting the peacemakers to talk with each other has been very positive. Being able to bring that to us as an American audience and then including congressional staffers, all of that, it matters. And so I invite you to consider holding a meeting in that format in the future um, and joining us and mapping in so that we build your numbers here in, in, um, in Irvine and in this area. So that's the overall concept, <laughs> the four parts. Hope you'll join us. Um, it's about children of Palestine, but it's about all children, you know, and certainly about building safety and security and an opportunity for all of us. Um, for them, for peoples there, and for building that sense of, of community and, and neighborliness as well. Um, and then I'm hoping to give you a sneak preview of just one more thing, which is something that happened in al Akba just recently. Um, so uh, may I take another minute and show you this? Okay. Um, so I mentioned that the women's building was constructed since the time when we held the architecture design charrette. Well, we brought two architects from Australia who wanted to volunteer to come and design with the Rural Women's Association. Um, designing like we give a damn is what um, <laughs> Hannah and, and Catherine um, put together. They looked at the women's building and really began to think about how it could include a, a cheese factory, a, a professional kitchen, a restaurant, a rooftop cafe, um, and looked at ways to bring Palestinian and, and Middle Eastern design into the picture. I've never received a proposal like this one before. I really enjoy it because as designers, they're, they're looking beyond um, what one might usually expect and, and thinking carefully about what could happen with this women's building to make it a signature, um, a community place that matters. And certainly doing it within cost parameters and. But, but still bringing a sense of beauty and community to the building. Um, so really fun to see some of the ideas that they're bringing forward about lighting, about furniture, um, about tiles, bathrooms, um, about how space is divided, and um, color as well. Alakaba gets really hot, really, really, really hot in the Jordan Valley in the summer. There's a saying that says, um, as crazy as a tourist in the Jordan Valley in summer, <laughs> which is when we brought the uh, design charrette there, I completely understood what that meant. <laughs> and it also gets pretty cold in the winter, it's maybe similar to here. Um, so here's more about their plans. The design will include professional, um, the cheese factory area, the, the, um, the bread, 
um, uh, ovens, and then upstairs the, the restaurant and the professional kitchen tiled on the outside with screens in the evening and um, forms of lighting and tile. So here are the designers who joined us and very exciting. I brought, I'm bringing that forward to different groups. This week or next week we hope to have a group of Christian um, builders coming to al to put forward a quote to help finish a part of this building. They're coming from Bethlehem. So very exciting to begin to see an openness about participation in, in the project overall. And you know, we'll see if we can raise the funds that can make this, you know, bring it to fruition. Um, but good to have the opportunity to ask. Okay. So that's my presentation.